my people. And once upon a time, I was the indicator, which means I was especially scary and important. I feel very at home being at a podium. You can only imagine why. But I'm also more of a negotiator for now and chill. So hopefully we can keep each other entertained and excited to be here and I can convince you of something new to me. You never really know. I'm also an author. I have written several books about autism, neurodiversity, and disability. I do not wish to be a salesperson. That's not my job. That is not my personality. If that's stuff you want to check out, by all means, I have another book coming out in November, which I'm super excited about. That's all about disclosure and telling your story. And I still can't believe I actually get to do this stuff and call it my job. So that's super cool. And I usually get to be a nerd about all things in the accessibility arena. And if you let me talk about disability law and policy, I get very excited because people don't let me do it. But when you do let me do it, I promise it's kind of exciting and kind of cool. So I do want to talk about access. I know that we have people joining us on Zoom. So for our Zoom folks, I want you to know that I take inclusivity seriously and that I also take it seriously for our people in person. So access is a team sport. We do this together. When I say that access is a team sport, we do this together. What I'm really getting at is that it's not up to me and it's not up to Illinois State University or our wonderful host to decide whether or not today is accessible for you or overall. So what you should have available to you is captions and transcript for our Zoom folks. I can figure out how to turn it on the PowerPoint, actually, if that is something that is of service to our in-person folks. If you are joining us online or whatnot as well, we are recording, I believe. Yes, we are. That is official. So you can come watch this back. If you think I talk too fast or you go, wait, I, I don't have time, I've got to get up. As far as our in-person folks, I know that y'all are seated at these nice long tables. I understand that for some of you, that is probably virtual. That's free hell. Or you just cannot sit still. If that is you, please feel free to get up. Go do a little happy dance. Go fidget. I was definitely up there in the panel, definitely banging my fingernail against the lectern, getting a little bit of unsolicited ASMR because it made me feel better and I wanted to hear some sound because I felt like I needed something other than to listen and focus on the sound of people's voices. Please do what makes things successful to you. I also fidget a lot. I wear rings to fidget a lot too. So sometimes behind the lectern, you can't tell, but I'm also doing what makes today accessible for me. Go get food, go get things, do whatever you gotta do. I trust you. If you do feel the need to leave the room, I am not going to be offended. I understand that some of us cannot sit still. Some of us have day jobs and are giving up something we're family related, work related, et cetera, to be here. So if you can go out, answer the phone, do whatever it is you need to do, please do it. I ask very nicely that you try not to make a ruckus and disturb everyone around you because otherwise we will probably be a little bit more judgmental. As for slides, happy to provide them to you, happy to make sure that they are in an accessible format. What that means, we have all text and screen reader accessibility. So any pictures that you see are going to have a little image description that helps our blind and low vision folks. If you want to know what alt text is in real life and you were curious what any of this stuff means, if you took a picture of my face, then you would get a readout that perhaps read something like, Haley is a white woman with red hair and bang, she's wearing red lipstick, a gray sweater with stuff on it. And I don't know, I don't even know how to describe my own sweater. I'm sorry, guys. But if you get the idea, it's enough that someone who's wide or low vision joining us over the phone would know that, oh, there's a new person and this is what she looks like. Oh. So let's jump right into our discussion today. We did talk about neurodivergence throughout the panel, and I know not everybody has been familiar with the term neurodiversity, so let's do a little bit of level setting to get our day started. So neurodiversity as a whole is referring to our different brains. We are a neurodiverse group of humans in this room, whether you were joining us in person or online, and all of our differences are to be recognized and respected as any other human variation. So the way that you process the world around you, and even today, is very different from the way I process it, the way that your friends, neighbors, colleagues, and loved ones are also processing the world around you. Case in point, when we were in the main ballroom, I bet most of you didn't notice just how bright and I'm not sure some of that light was. I certainly didn't be up at the lectern there, and I couldn't really say anything, but I was just like, oh my God, this lighting is so bad. Meanwhile, the rest of you are probably everything's fine, you know, taking notes, texting friends, doing whatever you're doing. And that's just how my brain is making sense of that space. And it's a very different way than yours was. So, honest question. We all went outside today. We all know the weather is a little bit kind of, you know, rainy, snowy. Definitely doesn't feel like spring, but somehow it is spring. How many of you were absolutely freezing? And not just me, because that was cold. Okay, there's like four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, you got 10 of you who raised your hand if you were freezing. 
I also with you that I was freezing, by the way. And I'm assuming that means the rest of you who didn't raise your hand because you were, were not freezing or not paying attention. And if you were not freezing, I envy you, first of all. But it doesn't mean that you're wrong for not being freezing when it is objectively 30 something degrees outside and there is light and rain with flurries, whatever it is that Florida girl does not know what that is. It's a brain breaking experience for me. I can count on one hand how many times I've seen any form of snow in my life. So for me, it's very exciting. And also, I was freezing my little face off because we get inside. So your brain makes sense of that stimuli. You're hot, you're cold, you don't even pick up on it. That's just how your brain is making sense. It doesn't mean you're right or wrong. Although, I really do question how some of you are able to do that better than others. And that's true for all of our brains, right? So we talk about people who are neurotypical. Who are in the majority of people, they're the brains that are kind of what society deems normal, as much as I really don't like that idea. But this is the people who act in accordance with what's expected of us based on their society, culture, tradition, customs. So you get the girl. And then there's the neurodivergent folks, which most of you are why you're here. It's more about the autistic neurodivergent people who have these differences in communication and thinking, and who may also have not just autism, but ADHD, learning disabilities. Correct and intellectual disability, mental health conditions, or an acquired cognitive disability. And something that comes up when we're talking about the disclosure is how we explain this stuff to other people. And I have had to do what we just did talking about neurodiversity to people who know a lot, people who know nothing, people who think they know something but are kind of like, you know, I've heard this word before, what do I do with it? And part of telling your story and disclosing is also knowing how to navigate some of these types of conversations. So when I just say we all have different brains, that might work really well for people who know absolutely nothing or when I have to talk to grade schoolers and middle schoolers. So the way that I talk to an audience of a bunch of unengaged 13 year olds, is gonna be very different than the way that I talk to you all who are largely adults and young adults and just people who are clearly not young teenagers. I assume you're young teenagers for the years probably in school right now. So just, Something to keep in mind in the way that we have these discussions really does change based on our audience who we're talking to and what our needs may be. The way that I talk about autism, because I get asked, and of course, very broadly, it is autism, except it's not after all, is stuff like, what is autism? And the way that any of us is going to answer that is going to be really, really different. If I ask every single person in this room today to tell me what autism is, I'm not going to get a straight definition that everybody agrees with or would use. That if I told you what my definition is, I have generally when I have to write this out, because that happens every so often, I use a very blended definition that you, that pulls from both DSM 5 and the Autistic Self Advocacy Network because I want everybody to feel affirmed. I want to encapsulate that autism is both a disability and a difference. And that here's the things that are really affected, such as sensory processing, social communication skills, that we have these differences, yada, yada. And I might also say, but for me, this means that I cannot do loud and crowded. I, struggle to read social cues and for some reason my spatial perception is so bad that driving and parking a car is a mystery that I get to solve. I cannot park. I hate it. It means I am very good at bumming rides off of everybody I know. I'm good at using my own two feet. I can actually navigate public transportation and all sorts of interesting skill sets as a result of the fact that I have been with whatever my brain does. And I purposely will say that none of this is bad stuff. So that's kind of just how we have these explanations because the way that we talk about things is going to influence other people's perception. Something to keep in mind, if I frame autism as my doom and gloom and everything in my life that is hard for me, you're going to feel a kind of what? You're probably going to feel pity. You're probably going to feel bad for me. You're probably going to look at autism as a big scary thing that comes out to play. Not, you know, it's just part of my life. It is what it is. It's For me, it's mostly a neutral. I don't know any different. I will never know any different. I'm just in love with it. It's, you know, the hand in life I've been dealt. Which brings us to disclosure, which is really what we're here to talk about today. And when we think about disclosure, we're really talking about how we tell our stories and how we tell other people about autism or a related disability. So this happens in so many different settings, so many different places. And honestly, disclosure, I always tell people, is a form of mental gymnastics. Because you're always making decisions in the moment or ahead of time, figuring out, do I tell you? Who do I tell you? How do I tell you? What is this person going to say and do when I tell them? Why am I here in the first place? I've had people look at me and say, 
But you don't have to look autistic. And I've had people go, how can I support you? And then I've had people go, what's that? And then I've had people go, that's really interesting. You know, my friend's cousin's sister's second stepchild is has autism. And have you yoga? That might be really helpful for you. And, and you know, when you're dealing with all this different stuff, it's kind of funky. Usually the person who says the whole spiel about the yoga is the person I need an accommodation from. And I'm sitting there thinking, thank you. That was extremely helpful and vital. Can you just help me make sure that I can have it sensory presence space for like 20 minutes? It would really make a difference. And meanwhile, I'm getting this like people just trying to advocate for myself. But when we think about disclosure, we're really talking about this process and different tools to share disability status. And basically what we're really looking for at the end of the day boils down to three major things. Support, accommodations, and acceptance. And no matter who you are, there is a place for you in this conversation. I know the adults or the non-autistic people are probably thinking, you know, I don't have to disclose as much, or maybe I do because I'm a parent and I have to tell the other parents, I have to tell the teacher. I sometimes don't know if I'm going to even tell the clerk at the grocery store when my child has a meltdown. This is stuff that is important to you. It is also important as a self-advocacy topic. And just remember, a lot of it does boil down to that support, accommodation, and acceptance. So what does that sometimes look like when we tell our story and what we're aiming for? That sometimes you have to think about what our goals are. That maybe it is that accommodation. Maybe it's finding a sense of community. If you were here for this morning at the panel, you know that there's kind of a community vibe and you had a lot of talking about experiences of other neurodivergent people. And of course, we were slightly late in starting our session because we were finding community with each other because when you find your other autistic people and you have at least one similar interest, you will immediately become best friends in about five minutes and you will be able to basically live about no other thing. You know, wait, I need to know everything about this thing and you have the same thing, I got to know which is the bot. So community is a big reason that people are here. As well as wanting more help, information, guidance, because there's so many things that we learn from each other. One of the, some of the best things that I've learned from other people in the community, thank you, disclosure, is how to be a good corporate office and have a job. These are certain life hacks that you will learn thanks to other people, how to not burn out and how to put up with some of the ridiculous stuff that they're Also, it's just thinking about confidence, support coming from all these different things. Support means so much, right? And I know for some of the parents, support for you is very different than support for me. Some of you might be sharing stuff about your family in order to seek some respite, in order to get some guidance, whatever it may be. And I want to keep this in mind. And when we talk about the disclosure, I do want to point out one big thing. A lot of the times people think this is compulsory, that you have to do it. You have to share. You have to share tons of information. You have to be really an expert to do it. And truthfully speaking, you not you are almost rarely compelled to disclose in a mandatory sense. However, if you do need accommodations at work or school or in the community, it's usually that they share. Usually your community programs are not going to ask you for a mile high stack of papers and documentation. If I tell a local community service that I need an accommodation, such as casting the transcript to go to a webinar, for instance, you're not going to ask me for years and years of audit and paperwork. You're just going to, you know, grant said request because we're supposed to, especially if it's an event or something that's open to the public, you use different standards of the law. So generally speaking, this is your stuff that is covered under the law, which is my happy key moment, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, that many of us are probably familiar with in order for our students to receive individualized education plans and have their access to a free and appropriate public education in K-12 system or until the age that they age out. And then, of course, we have our big boy in civil rights when it comes to disability, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. If you think that you haven't had time to think about this, it is older than me. You had plenty of time to think about it. And the ADA essentially allows us to have support and protection in school, in work, in all sorts of different sectors, like public and state, local government programs, our public accommodation, telecommunications, all of those stuff. I feel like I just ran through that too quick because my brain is talking faster than I know. So I apologize for that. It happens a lot that this guy moves faster than this one. So we're making the most of our situation here. 
And when you think of things that are covered, if you share this status about yourself, you get the protection of base. Like people can't discriminate against you because you have an ability. Make sense? Got, got it. Awesome. That's kind of the simple version of, yes, that kind of compulsory share to get the protection because people who don't know keep, you know, they didn't discriminate against you. Have to discriminate against you. They don't know. So you kind of want that protection. I know a lot of people, especially in the workforce, but in work, especially, and we'll talk about this a little bit, you are entitled to accommodation because you are a person with a disability. I know some people have very varied views on autism as a disability versus a difference, but under your civil rights, it is indeed a disability. So kind of something to keep in mind. And all of our situations look different. Every situation I've ever been in and how I disclose is very, very different. And I say this because I've disclosed so many times in my life. I've done it at school, I've done it with teachers, I've done it with peers, I've done it on admission essays and applications, I've done it with job interviews, I've had to somewhat disclose on my resume because I can't talk about the work I've done without you going, oh, by the way, she's definitely on this. Like, why is she so involved in autism? I have had to have the awkward conversation on our first date. I have had to do all the things when it comes to this. Movie. It's very fun and it's also very stressful. So just a little bit of stuff to be thinking about when we're going through this, why I like to bring you back to this idea of mental gymnastics. It is a lot of adapting and sometimes on the fly. And not only that, you're accounting for what the other person may or may not do. So we're gonna go through Certain things that are really great in certain ideas and also for our different types of audience folks here. So I know we have family members here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take a quick informal poll. We have our parents and family members who want to learn more in our audience. Okay, we have a couple of you. We're grateful. And of course, you're all hiding in the back. I don't judge. I don't judge. I promise they take funny y'all are in the back. It's like a pattern. I'm probably out to say Brady loves patterns. There's a pattern in the back that all the family members are back. So usually I get asked, who do I share this with and what do I share? And this is a difficult question because of course you know your children and family members better than I certainly. I do not come here to tell you what to do, but I always tell people very nicely to consider balancing your interests along with theirs. This is especially true if you spend a lot of time on the internet. And I see a lot of parents who will overshare on the internet about their kids' disability and struggles. And I, it makes me feel a kind of way. It makes me feel really strange when I see parents who are sharing about their like 10 year old and they are sharing like, oh, Johnny had a meltdown at school today or, oh, and of course it's an accompanying video. Or the, you know, Mary got her first period and it's like, did Mary think that's this? Is this in her best interest? Is this something that we can have a discussion about very honestly as far as privacy, relevancy, all this stuff? Because Generally, when I think about our child's interests, my acid test on them is if my, would I be embarrassed if my parents said this about me and it wasn't something relevant, such as, you know, if I'm, I'm, I'm a pediatrician and I'm not ready to, you know, have that conversation with my doctor, but my parents are there and they're, of course, going to have to tell my doctor, for instance, yes, you had your report. You know, it makes sense versus telling the internet in the name of awareness. So just a couple. There and also here some of the time a lot of time on the internet. We can have a whole discussion all about the internet, which sometimes we get dragged into. I also want to think about what we share and who we share with, our relationship with who we're talking to, that our relationship with other family members, of course, we're going to share this type of stuff. We might not want to share it with all of Facebook, but we might want to share this with Aunt Sally or somebody else in our family. We might want to tell them about what's going on, why. Autism is part of things, what's going on as far as our child, our sibling, our loved ones, whoever. I feel very differently about this in certain real life things. So I also think about when we do community programs, which is a great time often to disclose. So say your local library has stories. And this is probably one of my favorite examples I've been given and that I like to share. That if you're the family member or the parent that wants to take your kid, it might be smart to tell the people hosting at the library ahead of time, like, hey, my kid has autism. My kid really is excited about story time, but sometimes they swarm around a little bit or might feel that they can interrupt because they know the story that we're reading. I just wanted you to know, and if there's anything that I can do to help or that we can do to support them. Like that's very typical because of course we want our kids to have the best experience. 
it doesn't really violate their privacy too much. And it's enough that, you know, we can make sure that everybody feels supported and safe and, of course, give our kids the opportunity to participate in something like a community story time. Just kind of a quick thing there when we talk about our potential support as well as respite care and other things too. And of course, our purpose for this information, I know a lot of us share for many different reasons. We talk about support, accommodation, and acceptance. I also think about this when we are in random public situations. So I have been a difficult kid. And I say this with nothing but love as a former autistic child. I held it down in public a lot. I was a tantrum thrower in grocery stores. My parents could not control me. I was kind of what you just do with a brat. And as this kid, sometimes my parents had to say, hey, it's not that we can't control her or that she's been behaving, but she's overwhelmed because she's up. That that might have been relevant in the moment. And I think about this purpose of sharing thing very much so. And of course, it's all, we also have our consent thing when it comes to things like the internet or at our children's age, because sometimes when you're an adolescent or teenager, you probably get embarrassed of the things that your parents say about you. It's probably happened to every single person in this room. In fact, there's a good chance your parents still embarrass you. And they need it, and of course they love you, and that's why they do it. And they don't realize that they're embarrassing, but everybody's parents are embarrassing to some extent. But you know, just part of the course. And of course, this brings the whole other conversation into disclosure is talking to your autistic children or family members about autism. And there's so many reasons, because probably the thing that kills me the most that I experience is people who don't have this conversation is that they don't really want to, or they don't really know how to, because they just avoid it entirely. And knowing your autistic as a young person is such a powerful thing that not only do you understand something about yourself and your life suddenly might make sense that you have access to this information. You're like, oh my God, I'm not here. This is why my brain does what it does. Or, and also to recognize your own strength and different awareness and self-esteem building. I also talk about this in self-advocacy. You heard from most of our lived experience panel today that the, almost everyone was diagnosed a little bit later with the exception of M who was diagnosed at 14 and how those experiences shaped the support and advocacy skills they were building. So building self-advocacy skills as an adult is a little bit different than getting the building blocks when you're young. So I started really getting the building blocks at nine, 10 years old being included in 504 and IEP meetings, being able to share what my goals were with my teachers that you start getting this early on. And when you have that awareness and a little bit of vocabulary behind it, it makes things a little bit easier. And you don't have to, even when we talk about young people with this and kids, like little kids and even 10 year old me, I definitely was not having the advocacy conversation we're having today. 10 year old me was saying, I want to make new friends, preferably girls, because all of my friends were boys. And I thought I was supposed to, you know, maybe make friends who were girls. So having, the ability to say that and realizing that was, if I said that at one of these meetings, it would be somehow woven into my goal and the outcome that we would work towards. That's awesome. And they did help me make friends with girls. I even got to touch their hermit crabs at Show and Tell. And I was very scared. And I had a sensory aversion to the little like poking my fingers. But that's how you know you make a friend in the fourth grade when they let you touch your, their hermit crabs and their pets and all their stuff. We, of course, were not friends after the fourth grade because reason, but the fact that it was written into a plan because I got to help use whatever minimal advocacy skills I had as a 10 year old to be a part of that conversation was pretty awesome. And something else I would like to point out, especially for autistic kids too, not just autistic kids, but kids in general, I was a psychology major. Kids are smarter than you think they are. We don't give them credit when credit is due a lot. There's a good chance, just like every single one of our panelists has said, they knew they were different. They knew there was something about them that was not like other kids. So chances are, you already know you're different, and having an answer is really great. And especially our somewhat older children might have had access to this information and figured it out themselves anyway. I think of so many young people who spend time on the internet and also the algorithms on things like TikTok, Reels, et cetera, start showing them what they need to know. And even though they don't know it, I know that I've gotten plenty of ADHD content, for instance, and that has helped other things, like in my brain. It's a story that has happened to many of my friends and colleagues, like, oh my God, certain things make sense. So there's plenty of information out there and plenty of things we have access to to maybe already have this idea that, you know, we're different. 
And of course, when you have these conversations as a family, it helps build trust and keep us having a good, supportive, and loving and trusting relationship that you're not hiding the eight ball. Please don't hide the eight ball. It really probably feels like betrayal if you know something really important and then you just don't tell us. If you had someone in your life who's withheld, withheld really important information and then told you later, you're probably like, how did I not know this? It's kind of a, you don't want to create unnecessary tension in your lives. So how do we have these conversations? And we don't have the eight ball just like we talked about. And I also get asked a lot about, is there appropriate ages and stages to have these conversations? And the answer is no, there's no perfect age. So I was nine, it was awesome when I got cold, it worked well for me, we're gonna talk about that in a moment. And I would say use language that's appropriate based on someone's maturity, understanding, things like that. And this goes for everybody, just use something that's appropriate and try to be as accurate as possible and assume that people are smarter and competent and can learn. So I do this even with my employ with employers, I do this with friends, is I want to be accurate in what I'm sharing. I want to also assume that they are open-minded, willing to learn, and can and are able to. Not because perhaps they have an intellectual disability or are mentally verbal that they won't understand. And also just having this ability to be a normal part of the human experience in your house that it's not something that you you gawk at and stare in public. I thankfully grew up with a very familiar attitude on this. So my grandmother had multiple sclerosis. My mom has a physical disability and is also neurodivergent. But this ability was not really some big surprise in my life. And looking back on it, I'm like, wow, everything kind of checked out. No wonder I had a really affirming childhood. No wonder I understand things that some of my peers just never did because I was around disability in the whole Even though I didn't understand disability community and disability rights, I didn't understand how much people were being it with. I still had an idea of what it was like that I wasn't like, what's wrong with that person when I was on public. We also want to affirm people for who they are, that nothing is truly wrong or broken. And of course, give people room to be curious, especially if it's our kids. We want them to be curious. We want them to ask questions. We want them to understand themselves better. Of course, if people are asking you questions and it is not your family or someone who is learning about themselves, it can be a little weird. For instance, I get asked a lot of very personal questions at conferences like these that I go off and feel comfortable at answering that, and that's okay. So I have been at podium having a conversation like this with y'all, and somebody will come up to me at the end and they will ask about my sex, which is, you know, not related to this whatsoever. But just because they want to know and they're curious about how I am on the side. Or they will know that I went to law school and they'll ask me what my LSAT school, which I probably would not ask another person what their LSAT school. That's not like it's that relevant to me, you know, or past that phase of your life. I don't know what any lawyers that practice with self that scores are and what I wish to know. But there's room for making space for curiosity and also setting boundaries at the same time. But when it is someone who's learning about themselves and it is your kid, you want them to know, you want to arm them with good information that is accurate and that you understand and also help them build that identity. And for those of us who want to keep learning, and also this is a great tool to have in your toolbox no matter who you are, including our teachers, and you want great media to introduce people who share the same neurotype or disability. So I know a lot of us watch a lot of TV. I watch a lot of representation on TV all the time. It's like a bad hobby that I can't quit. A lot of times I end up feeling very frustrated. So I will watch everything autism related that comes across my Netflix feed. You bet I have watched every season of Love on the Spectrum, Atypical, Extraordinary Attorney, you name it, I've probably watched it. And I have also wanted to scream for the Lord watching Rain Man that continues not to age very well. I watch all this stuff, and every time great books come out, I will buy them. I will read them. Sometimes the publishers are really nice and even send me free copies. So I love media, and I also love media of all ages and stages. Some of the best teaching tools that I have in my toolbox are picture books. I don't care that I am 30 years old. I have still used picture books with adults who will appreciate good artwork and good storytelling and also something that's affirming because sometimes it feels like it's like healing your inner child. So one of my favorite, one of these things that I have used that has made other people feel affirmed to understand better is there was a book called like All Cats Are on the Autism Spectrum and I loved it so much that when the second edition came out, the author asked me to write a report which was like the key moment of my life. And definitely the equivalent of like an Olympic gold medal for me. 
So it was very cool. And it was something that felt very affirming, very awesome. Lots of cool stuff out there. I can give you book recommendations all day long or just need your recommendations to kind of nerd about it. And also, if you have autistic people in your life, please have more of us. We are also friends. We're funny. We're loyal. And we have a lot to say to you. And also, it's really great. It's the one thing I wish I had more of growing up is more autistic people around me to learn, from, especially if, like, my family members are friends with other autistic people. What did it make And I say this because I have a lot of friends now who are parents and siblings and all this, and we learn from each other, not just about the autistic experience, just people. And I think that's very, very awful, which also brings me to how we have these conversations in our own lives. So I want to talk about self-advocacy for just a little bit. I know we talked about it a lot this morning, but when we talk about self-advocacy even further, I want to think about how disclosure is sometimes messy and that we do this is a personal thing, which is why we want to learn about it. We want to help other people. We want to help ourselves. We want to be accepted and get accommodations or what have you at work. We want to improve on our family and romantic and friend relationships. And of course, there's also the whole big can of worms about the school. We can talk about disclosure and advocacy at school all day long when it comes to who could be your IEP meeting? What is your right? Let's talk about due process. Well, thankfully, I'm not a special education attorney. I am not the person to ask those questions to, although I could probably research it and give you some good answers. I do not wish to be that person. I went into healthcare litigation because I didn't have to deal with people. I got to deal with corporations and I didn't care what they did after five o'clock. I will happily give you guys what I can, but I also do not wish to get too involved because I will feel all things and I get empathy overload. So let's talk about disclosure for just a minute because some of us are thinking, I don't want to ever do this. And like we talked about, it's not compulsory. And if you don't choose to do it, it doesn't make things less valid. And you probably know autistic people in your lives who have never disclosed, will never disclose, or don't even know they're autistic in the first place. We want to give grace to those people too. And there's many reasons people don't share. And here's just some of them as a whole, is that we have that people are afraid of being perceived as less than or weak. This is especially true for certain people based on other minority characteristics, your age. I was always afraid of it when I was in law practice because I didn't want opposing counsel to find a reason to think I was less competent at my job. Is that if they looked at me as, oh, she's not going to think that question is a deadline, she's not professional, she's not fit to practice. I didn't want to say that stuff. And just the fact that I'm arguing my stuff. Don't attack me as a group. Not me. All is fair in litigation, except, you know, the ad hominem, you're a bad person stuff. There's a reason we have a couple ethical and professional standards. But ableism kind of can draw the line there, or maybe perhaps not. Some of us also have had the thing where we disclose that people can be a little too nice in their quest to be nice to us. And then they basically give you special treatment. You're essentially the adult version of the teacher's pet. And when you are the adult version of the teacher's pet, your peers don't like you. It makes life a little bit harder. I've been the adult version of the teacher's pet. So when I first disclosed in my first job, Everybody was really accommodating and really accepting. I was in a traditional law firm. And usually, if you've been in a traditional law firm structure, the like partners, the people that are the shareholders, the really busy ones, are the ones billing way more money than everybody else. And they're usually too busy to even answer a simple question. For me, I got taken out to lunch. And I got taken out not just to lunch. I got taken out to the fancy takeout, including dessert. I got the whole nine yards. You couldn't get these people to answer a question for 30 seconds. Me, I got to have an amount of lunch to the family they have. No other associates in my office ever got that, ever. Needless to say, when lunch would come on the month, the side eye that I would receive, the amount of stuff I'm sure people said behind my back was real. And personally, I was very happy to have a family stay I was very happy especially because the dessert menu was fantastic. And they had a homemade Oreo ice cream with the like magic shell art chocolate sauce. That was fantastic. I truly miss it. It was one of the best like disability person job. And I say to the club, there are a couple of times you like when you do disclose you get perks. That was one of the perks. The other perk that you get is of course the DP perks and advanced reservations. And then everybody wants to be your best friend because if they're on your reservation, they get to take advantage of your disability. So that is what this building is genuinely your favorite amount of what you do. That is my exception to the rule on all of this stuff as someone who enjoys the art and just me. 
we'll be riding along with our special treatment. Because of course, you just want to be treated like everybody else. You want people to accommodate you, but also do it within reason to the point that you're not giving everybody else a reason to hate you, or that you are going out of your way to make things basically roll out the red carpet of things that were not asked for and not needed. I did not request any fancy steak lunches. I just wanted to be able to wear my headphones and turn off my fluorescent and light in the office. Nothing special that would have cost them anything. Nothing that would have been too out of the ordinary, except, you know, I think everybody definitely made fun of my little back cage because I would always shut the lights off and it'd be like a little forever in the desk with like, no lights. So, but that was what made the country friendly and accessible for your truly. There's also this idea of internalized ableism. We did not really talk about ableism today, but kind of just your quick cliff notes here is ableism is your different biases, stereotypes, and prejudices against people with disabilities and the way that we treat them negatively. When this is internalized, it is what happens when you begin to believe all of the stereotypes, negatives, et cetera, about your disability. For instance, I am very bad at asking for help. And I know a lot of us are talking about self-advocacy and seeking support and seeking accommodation. I am very good at telling you to seek accommodation and support. I'm horrible about it for myself. And that's because of internalized ableism. I think if I am asking for support, I am burdening somebody else. That it is too much that I'm going to put them out. They're not going to want to help me. They're going to dislike me for it. Internalized ableism to me looks like many different things, but that's kind of how it shows up in disclosure. Other ways that it shows up is I think that I'm not good enough. I think that I have to do all the things to get the same respect. It is exhausting. I have been working through this my entire life. There's also, of course, our stereotypes and potential for discrimination if you disclose because the wrong person, even though you disclose, you probably have some legal protection. Retaliation does happen. People will treat you differently. They might not assign you the same amount of work. They might purposely diminish your responsibility, find a way to eventually get rid of you. All sorts of stuff that are, you know, not supposed to do. And of course, happens, unfortunately, as evidenced by some of the people that show up in my inbox after support all this stuff. Yeah, I never did. And then there's, of course, concern for different licensing, professionalism, and other things for our adults. So how do we have this conversation? That's what we really want, right? We want to know how to, how to have these thoughts. And the biggest thing, of course, is like telling any good story, knowing what your goal is and how you do it is going to influence how other people react. When I used to disclose as a young person, I would be armed with every fact, figure, everything that was possibly available, and I would basically be the book report on autism. Needless to say, when you were 15 years old and you were a book report talking to another 15 year old, they're scared. They're into it. The first time I did this, one of my friends stopped, looked at me, and went, So are you going to die so you lose her? Like, that's how serious I was because I didn't know how to have a conversation in a way that I was just thinking, Look, I just want to know that there's a reason I just don't want to get them. And that you need to kind of translate to each other, sort of like a margin, you know? And instead, she thought I had a terminal illness and was basically giving her the equivalent of biocancer. So maybe not the best approach that I could have taken. So what I've learned is how I tell my story or even to say I'm autistic is going to influence how other people are going to treat that information. Which is why if I'm talking to my friends or someone I haven't really spent a lot of time talking to about, they're stupid. I would be very friendly. I will just mention something in passing and sometimes it's just really funny. One time we were at a conference with a friend of mine, and they had these giant crystal chandeliers in the ballroom. And I was leaving them and telling the whole story, like, Am I the only one who can't stop staring at the crystal chandelier? It's like a sensory version of bliss. Because it was just so much fun to me. That I had no clue what was going on up here. My eyeballs were just there in space as this Marriott chandelier. I remember this very vividly. And it was one of those things that it was the moment that they understood. So that made sense. And then it was like, oh yeah, that's because you like sensory stuff, right? And like, bingo, super easy disclosure, not really a lot to say. And I wanted to think about what those goals are, what those who, when, where, what whys are, and how to close through. Sometimes it's okay, I want you to know that sometimes X can be difficult for me because I want to see it. Yeah. And when I say it like that, someone's usually pretty cool about it. 
which is why most people know don't put me in very loud and very proud space. And usually people are good about this. They should be a me. Because nobody actually wants to be a jerk to people with disabilities, right? Right. You know, you kind of are the worst kind of person if that's what you're doing. But if something mean or unreceptive, it doesn't mean that you did something wrong. It doesn't mean that you told the story the wrong way, which is so easy to think that maybe we didn't share enough context. Maybe we didn't say enough. Maybe we should have just never said anything. Truthfully, there are people who just simply aren't going to understand that some people are closed minded. Some people do not know what it's like to have a life experience that's different than yours as a family member, you as an autistic or neurodivergent individual, what have you. And honestly, some people, it's really good that they show themselves for what they are right away, rather than you have to find out later. But you will find your people. I love when people show their biases. I love when they show me that they're not going to be accepting. I love when they show me they're not someone I want to be around. I've had people say some of the darndest things when I've disclosed, and it has made my life infinitely better because I knew not to waste my time or energy. This has been true with dating, this has been true with friends, and this has been true with really basic questions of job interview because, you know, jobs are kind of two way treat, sort of like Tinder and trying to go and swipe right at each other and agree that they want you and you want them. So it makes it really easy when I know that they don't want me or I don't want them. All of these things are making a difference. So if someone is mean or unreceptive, it really actually is your benefit. I promise it saves you a lot of time and energy to find out they secretly can't stand you. So let's talk about school. Because I know that's something that people ask a lot about and something we talk about with our adults. Is when we think about how to best disclose, there's kind of two main schools of thought here. There's people who will never actually say anything, but want to say something or trying to get support, but really don't want to use any language or labeling. This is really great if you are self-diagnosed, by the way, or you are trying to figure it out. And there are many, and I know self-diagnosis is something that comes up a lot here. I am from the camp that this is a valid thing. There are many reasons someone may not get a diagnosis. Maybe it is a point in their life that it's not so relevant, it's expensive, it's hard to find a good provider, you live somewhere rural, you can go down, you're mostly marginalized, we can go down a lot of people don't always need this information. And sometimes people will hint at this information, but you can't really confirm or deny it, nor it's like your job to confirm or deny it. So some of them might mention that they're a member of a disability affinity group. So you might mention that you were, if you were in college, for instance, you were a past chapter president of, you know, your local autism organization, whatever. Okay, cool, got it. You probably have some kind of connection to this cause. Or you do what I do and you ask for support during baby, which is something that honestly benefits everybody, not just the neurodivergent disabled people around you. If you want to ask for support from your own colleagues, friends, whoever, trust me, it looks like a life day. It's like the best thing I ever can have a day And I got really good at saying, you know, it's really helpful or it was really great when you did this. And people will do the thing because you said it nicely. They're good at something. If I say, yeah, it was really helpful when you explained the details of where we're going, so then I knew what to expect. And then people know to just explain details and share more information than they normally would. They don't need to know why, but usually it just means we're being better communicators, and I know that always sounds really kind of silly when like to be a better communicator with everybody, but it goes a long way in all the one of those soft disclosure strategies. I do this a lot with people I work with and be like, can you just send me a follow-up and email within 48 hours? And I would think there's a good chance mentally I forgot about you or I didn't I mentally respond to you and I absolutely never because my brain got this. But I don't have to tell you about this. You will just send me a follow-up and go, oh my God, you asked me for a follow-up. I'm not gonna annoy the living daylight study you. Amazing. And I've heard actual concrete hard disclosure. Someone mentions they have a disability, usually in a professional life, their professional life. They will just come out and say, you can tell by observing them if it's a physical disability. They will describe it kind of, oh, I do this a lot in my work. So I will describe that what the autistic experience is or what it's done for me because I'm the author of this, I'm self-advocate, blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, somebody actually requests an accommodation because you have to be a qualified individual with a disability in order to get accommodation. Makes sense. Let's talk about this a little bit more as well. Is that people have situations that they feel they absolutely have to share, 
and those of us who share this information as volunteers. And I think about this especially at work, and I think about this in a lot of life too, is that you have people who feel that they absolutely need an accommodation under the law. You have people who are trying to adapt and get through life as best they can. And they've been self-accommodating their entire time. I self-accommodated in school a lot. I adapted with different note-taking strategies. I'm a history course note-taker that I would buy a clip note. I would find older students to be friends and take their, their notes from the semester before. I would do all these different things because me, note-taking, good luck. I still can't take notes if I am in a professional setting. Now I know better. Instead of adapting self-accommodating, I will just ask somebody else to send me their notes. That's it at this point. But when I couldn't self-accommodate anymore and I was struggling to adapt, there'd be a breakdown in how I was performing either academically or professionally and therefore needed to say, hey, this is what's going on. This is also true if you do not have an ability, if you've ever been in a professional or personal setting, you're not really yourself, other people are picking up on it, you're probably going to have to share something going on. That's especially true if you've had a major life change, such as grief, you moved, new kids, new stuff, you get the idea. There's a good chance if you are not yourself, you're going to have to stay home. And also there's a change in life circumstances. People sometimes feel compelled to disclose after diagnosis, make discovery as a need to know thing. Other people are volunteers. I volunteer this information. I have nothing to be ashamed of. I look at this as a neutral in my life. I don't know any different. And I want to take pride in my autistic identity. It is autism acceptance month after all, which means I want us to be accepting and I want to take pride in my community. We are a pretty cool, interesting, eclectic group of people. And we have a really long story and amazing history, if you ask me. I also want to limit misunderstandings. I am honest to a fault. It gets me in trouble. It makes my life feel like an extended sitcom sometimes. <laughs> if you have ever watched something like Seinfeld or Curb Your Enthusiasm or like what's the deal with whatever or some weird social race that they're pointing out obsessively, which also probably explains why I love these two different. Because it's basically like the autistic experience summed up in a neurotypical way, question mark, is like, why did this person cut in line to talk to somebody else? Oh my God. And I'm very, I will be very proactively honest and brutal at that. And then people think you're just being, you're being kind of a jerk or smart ally. Or if you ask me my opinion on something, if you ask me how I like your shirt and I don't like it, I will tell you. It has gotten me in many arguments with my friends and even at first. It's just part of life. And also some of us view neurodiversity and disability as a strength, which is super, super awesome. And we want you to know that. We want you to be accepting and also play up our strengths and give us the room to do that. So some of you as well are not are just allies, your friends, your family, your teachers. And sometimes people will just share stuff with you. Or that you're thinking, where is my room to do this? And what I want you to know is figure out why people are sharing information with you. Why is a family, a individual telling you they're autistic or not? Is it a fun fact? Is it being transparent? Are they requesting accommodations? Where in that support, acceptance, kind of, and accommodations find that? Where, which bucket do they fall into? And then what do you do? And of course, what I always want, usually do when someone shares this, I thank them. Because there's a certain level of bravery and vulnerability that comes into telling your story or sharing something that you know people might not react positively to. And the other thing that I do, and I've learned this from many friends, not everybody tells everybody that they're cautious or that their family members are. But there's some people I feel more comfortable with than others, most of us. So what I would do at work, whenever people would tell me things, I would also be an adjunct professor for a brief time. I taught three semesters of undergrad. And when I taught undergrad, I, of course, always have undergrad disabilities. And I would ask them if anybody else on campus knew. Because sometimes, you know, I would talk to the other professors and sometimes we shared the same students. I didn't want to tell them if they didn't feel safe telling the other professors that they needed assistance or anything like that. And sometimes they did say like, oh, Professor Stone knows that Professor Stone knows them to say, hey, how is our student doing with you? Is there something that I should know or can be doing better? Because we wanted to support them. We wanted them to be successful. And at the same time, I didn't have that permission or didn't know that someone else knew. I didn't want to violate somebody's trust. So make sure to know kind of what their, their vibe is and also be empathetic and listen. It takes 
again, a lot of bravery. It feels kind of vulnerable and it's kind of scary to tell someone what's going on in life. So, and if you really, really don't know what to say, other than just thank you, I also think you should say, how can I support you? It's kind of a cheat code here because it's a way that you can figure out what their intentions are and also figure out what concrete steps you should be taking. Because, and of course, find a way that's natural to you to say this, maybe how can I support you not your language, but something similar lets me know, oh, I'm struggling with sensory stuff. I don't know what to do. I am scared. I just wanted you to know. It kind of puts the ball back to someone else's court so you can figure out their intention. Because for me, I struggle a lot with figure out, figuring out the intention, especially because for some reason, people really trust me and will overshare. And I don't know what to do with the overshare. So that's why I would say thank you, how can I support you in a little bit less robotic way based on that person's sort of thing. So that's just a little bit that I want you to know when we think about how we advocate for ourselves and how we also be good at this when we're on the other side of someone advocating with us. Because at the same time, a lot of us want to support advocacy. You don't want to feel like a useless endeavor that just is being more silencing and more ignoring. We want to feel supported in everywhere that we go in our lives. And I know we have a couple of minutes, so I want to have a couple moments to take questions and breathe. I know some of us are probably thinking about lunch and other things. If you have questions, thoughts, and feelings and want to say hello after the session, but can't find me, find me down, or you watch the recording back, you are welcome to do so. I have my contact information available to you. And now I think it's a good time to see how everyone is thinking, feeling, take some questions, or if you're ready to go, just make a mad dash for food or move on with your day. So with that, I thank you and I'm grateful for your time, willingness to learn, and everything in between. So thank you. We do have time for questions, if anyone has any questions. It's okay for shot. Oh, wait, I did see a question in the back. Should, wait, should I run the mic or can you project? Oh, I think I I can, I can hear you, and I will repeat the question for our folks on Zoom, so no worries. I know you know the question you are trying to tell you about these people are kids, and I don't care. I just want to tell them how they should do this. I've been trying to get down this for a while since 2013. Excuse me. But I didn't think the whole education thing with him. And it was just two educators made such a profound difference in his life. sharing I just to repeat for or, or just sum up what you said for the folks on Zoom that one of the parents here wanted to point out how important it is for the educators to be here and that in her 23 year old son's life that educators really made a difference given struggles with mental health and everything else and that it really helped empower others. So thank you for sharing that. I hope I summed up as best I can. Yes, yes. Thank you, because sometimes I have, it takes me a little bit of time to process auditory information. I'm very visual. So I always want to make sure that I get kind of at least the gist right. And also my background means I like to be very green and consistent. Because if you ask lawyers why say it in seven words, you can say it in three. <laughs> Hi, we have a couple more thoughts, comments, feelings, questions. And I don't know where to start, but I think I saw some of that first. Where do we find community for support? Given that so much of this is the question was where, as an adult, I find support in the autistic community and where I find. Thankfully, the internet is a really big, vast place. There's a lot of wonderful hashtags and culture and organizations that are dedicated to supporting and empowering other autistic people. And the neurodiversity movement as a whole is really large. So I have found things in my local community that I don't usually go to, but I serve on the board system. 
there's a lot of really awesome programming that's for people seeking jobs, for women in particular, for all sorts of different things, just different support groups, if that's your thing. I never feel great about support groups personally because they're usually headed by some neurotypical person who will guide it and they're not really peer led. I like peer led support, which is why I love the internet. If you want to learn from the autistic community, because autistic people are awesome in the fact that they actually want to help you and they also want to help the youth. That some of my favorite hashtags to learn from are hashtag asking autistics and actually autistic. And I really have made friends through the internet. I have made community and somehow we all find each other. If you noticed, even at the panel earlier today, we all kind of like me. I can be friends with you outside of this. Like you currently, you might not have been able to see it happening, but standing up there, I can promise you, I felt it. They felt it with each other. It was like kind of a very cool communal experience that when you find other autistic adults in the wild, it is a very fun feeling. Like there's sort of this innate draw, most, to most, not all, but most perhaps. Because there's plenty of autistic people, just like all people. I just simply don't like. And I don't say that as a mean thing. There's just people that I'm not going to like. I'm not pizza. I don't please everyone. I'm not a crowd leader for everyone. There's people who are going to sit here thinking, hey, like, you kind of sound a little bit pompous. You talk a little bit too fast. You're this, you're that. I, I know I'm not for everybody, and that's okay. That's people. But community is something that you find even when you least expect it, especially if you're on a campus like this. There's also different disability organizations, sometimes a college disability resource center or a program such as ICFPS will have these types of things available to you and the autistic adults in your life. But autistic adults do exist. We are usually very happy to help. We sometimes don't even know we're autistic, which are some of the best people at the end of the day. And there's a lot more out there than you think, and there's lots of people who are trying to lead the charge to make more community based support. We have another. Okay, I know, yeah, the, you with, with the scarf. Sorry, I don't know how to give a description. Okay, so I'm just going to do some quick slides. I think these are parents' lives to some closure with peers because she really wanted to have a girl that was a friend that she wanted to be friends with and understand autism and put these together slides so that she can give some thoughts to explain what autism is and, um, you know, quickly ask questions and, um, and it really, I think, helps them build relationships that keep us through the middle school and high school. But I'm kind of wondering about what we're talking about, like, the ethics of that, or some still need to work back. I mean, if it worked out well and it's something the child was okay with and had that information themselves, I would probably be a lot more okay with it. I'm assuming there was a conversation before it came to you, or at least I would hope. So there's kind of feeling that I don't have until middle school. Okay. Um, but they just ask them to read it in the school. And then we did have a conversation. We had to get a lot of, you know, a lot of, we just saw a lot of peers from outlet yeah. school that some of them would be finished at middle school. Uh -huh. There was a lot of new people. Mm -hmm. And I felt like our school had a really positive. Mm -hmm. I also think it's easier when we're younger. Because I think little when we build the blocks of acceptance with little kids, they're usually a lot better at it than the teenagers and the preteens who, you know, it becomes about fitting in and conforming and all the different social roles that don't really exist when you're young. For instance, and so I think there's so much that goes into it. I really I am a big fan of learning this stuff, but I also wish it's sometimes a little bit more general. I get to teach little ones every once in a while. I don't even know what to do with the little because I enjoy adult learners a lot more. So, um, it's about teachers. A lot of them, I love flow with the child with disability type, something like that, especially when teachers are taught to the classroom. So, giving the students a stage and then you can talk about how you can. Yeah. But then, if you do something more general, perhaps, of, you know, hey, we're going to learn about different types of brains, and this is how some brains work, and some people struggle with really loud noises, and, you know, kind of just like, Easy mode, I guess, because you know you're dealing with different ages and stages, but it doesn't have anyone in particular. But there's always something, perhaps, based on this constellation of traits that somebody in your classroom perhaps you would want to identify with. If I said that some people really like loud noises, some people hate loud noises, that could be two people in my class, or that could be half. 
So I like to think of kind of using more general examples as not to be just too specific to one person. And you can tell even when I tell stories, I try not to out the different people in my life, even though usually my friends, especially when you're a diverse friend, like, oh, you're going to tell stories about us? Okay, cool. I'm like famous for the day. Like my friends are really funny about like, oh, please talk about me. Please slide this silly little thing into your presentation just because, you know, they want to be a part of it and they enjoy the fact that I will talk about our brains and other people will be accepting because they perhaps didn't grow up with that. So there's, it, it's really kind of just, I think, playing it safe, but also making sure the young people, especially, are getting the information that they deserve to have. Because we want them to be accepted, especially the neurotypical kids. And we want the autistic kids and the other kids that might be in a self-contained or special education classroom. We want them not to feel like something is inherently wrong with them, which is why I am a big fan of neurodiversity education as a whole in all ages and stages. It's kind of be like, hey, everybody's free to work differently. That's not a bad thing. Which is why I purposely started today off by talking about neurodiversity and how we might have that conversation without even saying I'm neurodiversity. Because it just sets the, kind of the groundwork for so many of us in life. Are we? Yeah, we're five minutes over. Oh, okay, we had a good conversation. I will stick around to answer a couple more questions. I probably definitely need a little bit of water because I've just been talking nonstop today. I have. I, I stole a little tiny one before we got the panel. And then somebody put the nice branding one up here. So it's kind of fun. And I thank you all again and go get some food or go move on with your day, whatever you're doing. And looking forward to the rest of an amazing day and the conversation going. We're breaking for lunch in the main room again. Question for you. Hi. Hi.